The Irish History Podcast is brought to you through the support of listeners like yourself. You can help get the show out more frequently by contributing at irishhistorypodcast.ie. That's irishhistorypodcast.ie. Hello and welcome to the Irish History Podcast. My name is Finn Dewar and this is the Christmas Special 2015. This show is also number 75 in the series, so I thought it's worth doing something different. Originally, I had intended to make an hour-long episode, but the topics I was going to incorporate are so different and varied, I've decided to split it into three shows, which will be released over the following days. So today, we kick off with five people you may never have heard of, but played a pretty important role in history. This includes the fascinating story of a 50-year-old Irish woman who came within millimetres of assassinating the fascist dictator Benito Mussolini. This episode also contains a good update as to where my upcoming book is at and finishes with a competition. Before we begin though, a lot of you have been in touch about the Castle Comer series and where it's at. Don't worry, I will be finishing that first thing in the new year. Those shows, though, are really hard to put together. Lots and lots of research has to go into each show, and that means I have to spend time in archives, as there aren't that many books written on Castle Comer's history. Also, for those of you inquiring about the Norman Invasion series, I am going to return to that. That'll be in late February, early March. But now to today's show, and I'm kicking off with Mussolini's would-be assassin in the 1920s. Europe in the 1920s was a heavily divided continent. World War I had taken a huge toll on society and Ireland wasn't the only country to experience a revolution in its aftermath. Germany and more famously Russia also saw huge changes while Italy became engulfed in what was known as Bieno Rosso, the two red years between 1919 and 1920 where thousands of strikes took place. At the opposite end of the political spectrum, the Nazi party emerged in Germany, while in Italy, the fascist dictator Benito Mussolini took power in 1922, promising to put down the potential of revolution. While he would become notorious, Mussolini did receive widespread support from conservative forces across Europe. Indeed, he was not without his fans in Ireland. In 1923, the senator, Oliver St. John Gogarty, somewhat ludicrously compared Mussolini to the greatest philosophers and writers of all time, Plato, Aristotle, Virgil and Dante. However, some saw the dangers the Italian dictator posed, and not least among them, an Irish woman, Violet Gibson. In 1926, she attempted to kill Mussolini, then known by his self-appointed title of Il Duce, or the leader. As he left an engagement at the International Congress of Surgeons, Gibson, a 50-year-old woman, shot him three times, hitting him twice. Unfortunately for history, humanity, and indeed Violet, she only grazed his nose, and she was immediately set upon by the surrounding crowd. It was only the intervention of the Italian police that saved her before the mob killed her. Normally, such a threat would result in a swift execution, but Mussolini feared the backlash of meeting out such harsh treatment to a 50-year-old woman who was not without connections, as we shall see. Indeed, Mussolini ultimately let Violet go in 1927, and she spent much of the rest of her life in a mental asylum in Northampton in England. It has never been satisfactorily answered exactly why Violet Gibson tried to kill the Italian dictator. She certainly was not the most likely of assassins. Her father had been none other than the Lord Chancellor of Ireland, and her brother was Lord Ashburn. She was often referred to in the Irish newspapers as the Honourable Violet Gibson. However, Violet had been something of a renegade all her life. In 1902, she had converted to Catholicism, which at the time was a deeply controversial thing to do. She also flirted with radical ideas of the day from Irish nationalism to radical forms of Catholicism. While Mussolini was quick to blame everything on the fact that she suffered from mental illness, there were many across Europe who shared Violet's disdain of fascism. Indeed, her attempt to kill Mussolini probably did not seem like the act of a crazy woman by 1945. Ultimately, it was left-wing partisans who did away with the dictator when they captured him at the end of World War II. 
after gunning him down in Milan with his mistress Carla Patacci, they posthumously humiliated him by hanging his naked corpse upside down for days in public. Violet herself survived World War II and died in 1956 in obscurity. The second person we're looking at in today's show is a man called Daniel Houghton. Now when we think of early European colonists in Africa, we might think of the famous meeting between David Livingstone and Henry Stanley. However, decades before this ever happened, an Irishman was leading the way for the British Empire to ruthlessly exploit the continent. In 1788, Houghton set out to find Timbuktu, the capital of Mali and the source of the Niger River, which lie roughly in the middle of the Sahara Desert. In the 18th century, these were almost fabled places to Europeans. The last known European to visit Timbuktu had been way back in 1512. Houghton's mission, while perhaps seeming an innocuous journey of discovery, was in reality the first step of British conquest. This was the expressed intent of those who funded such explorations into what were unknown areas, to Europeans at least. In true European colonial style, Daniel paid more attention to his nearly 2,500 year old accounts from the works of the Greek historian Herodotus than to local knowledge of the people who actually lived in West Africa, for whom Timbuktu had never been lost. Unsurprisingly, his journey was plagued with disasters from the outset. After African merchants tried to kill him, he subsequently lost all his baggage in a fire. Eventually, he made the disastrous move of hooking up with some Moorish merchants, after which he shortly disappeared. A few years later, Mungo Park, a Scottish explorer who followed in his footsteps, heard that after he tried to turn back, the merchants either killed him or abandoned him in the desert to die. Either way, nothing more was heard of Houghton. It is likely that he would never have returned had he found Timbuktu. The inhabitants of the city knew only too well what interaction with Europe meant and they killed Gordon Lang who reached the city in 1826 fearing his return home would spark European or more specific British exploitation. While Daniel Houghton was not exactly a figure to celebrate our next figure was even less so. Dubbed the wickedest woman in history the story of Eliza Lynch is strange to say the least. Eliza Lynch began her life with a very common 19th century Irish experience. Born in Cork, her early years were marked by misery. Along with her family, she fled starvation during the famine. However, they took something of an unusual emigrant route when they moved to France. In Paris, anything common about Eliza's life ended. There she met the heir to the Paraguayan dictator Francisco Solano and the two became lovers. Eliza and Francisco returned to Paraguay in South America and in 1862 Francisco succeeded his father as dictator making Eliza the first lady of the country. However the pair were not exactly skilled in the arts of running a country and they treated Paraguay like a fiefdom. Eliza and her husband embezzled a vast amounts of money and then, in 1865, they started a disastrous war against not only one, but three neighbouring countries. In this war against Brazil, Argentina and Uruguay, Paraguay was devastated with upwards of 50% of the population being killed. Eliza's husband, Francisco Solano, was killed in the defining battle of the war, but Eliza herself was allowed to return to Europe after a brief spell in prison. However, she was not finished and had the audacity to return to Paraguay in an effort to get her hands on the money she and her husband had embezzled. Unsurprisingly, she was not successful. Eliza died in 1886, but strangely, her story didn't end there. By the 1980s, she had somehow been transformed in, into a hero of Paraguayan nationalism and in 1986, on the centenary of her death, she was exhumed and reburied in Paraguay. Next we look at another Irish exile, but this time a man who was instrumental in one of the greatest events in European history, the French Revolution. In 1789, in now famous events, the French people rose against their monarchy and established a republic. In the following years, the revolutionary government launched what is known as the Terror, where thousands of their enemies were done away with at the guillotine. Many historians point to the revolution as a seminal moment in the emergence of modern Europe. 
Indeed, its impact was so great that the Chinese communist Chow and Lai supposedly quipped in the 1960s that it was still too early to assess its long-term impact. Right in the heart of the story of the revolution was none other than an Irish carpenter from Wexford, Joseph Kavna. In the 1790s, Kavna became a prominent member of the revolutionary police in Paris. He was involved in the arrest of the Duke of Orleans, and perhaps even more famously, he arrested Charlotte Corday, who, in turn, had killed the revolutionary leader, Jean-Paul Marat. You may actually be aware of this event from a famous painting called The Death of Marat, where it shows Marat dying in a bath. Anyway, Kavna, through the early 1790s, was an increasingly important figure and close associate than none other than Maximilian Robespierre, the leading figure of the revolution. Indeed, at one point, it seemed this one-time obscure Irishman was going to be a man who would help lead France into the 19th century. Alas, it wasn't to be, though. In 1794, Robespierre, having executed one too many of his enemies in the infamous Reign of Terror, was himself seized and brought to the guillotine. Joseph Kavna disappeared at this point. He may have been killed, or perhaps wisely decided that the time had come to leave politics aside, given his associates were losing their heads at an alarming rate. The final figure in today's show was a man whose discoveries might explain the crazy weather we've been having of late. If you live overseas, Ireland at the moment is inundated with unprecedented levels of rainfall, even pretty high by our standards. To explain this usual weather though, we need to look back at the pioneering work of an Irish scientist called John Tyndall. One of the leading scientists in the 19th century, Tyndall's life was somewhat exceptional. He was educated in the less than formal environment of a hedge school, which educated children in the 19th century on the most meagre of resources. However, he rose through the ranks to succeed the famous scientist Michael Faraday as Professor of Physics at the Royal Institution. Tyndall seems to have been a bit of an all-rounder, because in his spare time, he also became a pioneer of mountain climbing, being among the first to climb some of the highest peaks in the Alps. However, his most important work saw him prove, beyond doubt, the greenhouse effect, the process which heats up our planet. Unfortunately, neither he nor any of his contemporaries realised that humans burning fossil fuels could increase the effect which would lead to the current changes in our climate. Until tomorrow, Sloan.